I would encourage folks in partnerships to do it right off the bat when they step into a role, which is uh, reach out to your cross-functional team members, uh, whether it be sales or CSMs are a great example because you know they're there to make the customers super successful and the uh, ongoing support and you know the ongoing uh, adoption of your platform. And that's a great way to basically get that customer interview and ask them like, what does your journey look like? Or show them a visual like, hey, this is what we think the journey is from what we've heard from some folks. Is this accurate? And if so, as you go through the journey, like what are the biggest pain points that you're running into? We're back at last. Welcome to the Nearbound podcast. Isaac, um, I was reminiscing today. I, I saw all these posts on LinkedIn about um, Nearbound and the Rise of the Who Economy, the book. And uh, one of them was referencing how they heard about the book at the summit, which we were like, hey, we kind of teased it there. And then we but, ended up Well, because it. it was supposed to be published like shortly after <laughs> and it took a little longer. <laughs> it, took a little, it took a little longer. But um, the, th the thing that it kind of reminded me of was – do you, you obviously remember how we pulled off that first work workbook, right? Yes, I will tell you how. It was Airtable. It was Airtable. Some ah. crazy plugin, some crazy plugin that Jared found. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what I could do is I, I was able to take like a hundred plus speakers, and mm. I was able to put like all their information, the QR codes, and all these things, and it would spit out a PDF that we mm. then turned into the workbook for the summit. So that's my uh, you know cheeky way of giving a shout out to a company that I love. And then um, some of the plugins and integrations and things that I've personally used. Uh, our guest today, uh, we have Nelson Wang, the global head of partnerships from Airtable. And of course, the founder of Partner Principles. Y'all have seen him on LinkedIn. If you haven't, go follow him and check him out. Nelson, welcome to the Nearbound Podcast, my man. Yeah, thank you. So awesome to be here. Really excited to do this. And I love hearing about that use case. There's so many different types of use cases on Airtable. So it's always interesting to hear about the new ones that pop up. Really cool of you to share that. Yeah, that truly, I'm not exaggerating. Like that was a life saver because we were like, how are we going to turn all of this into a workbook? This is going to be like trying to format it and everything. It was, uh, it was pretty incredible. So, and that speaks to having an ecosystem because I don't know who built that plugin, mm -hmm. but it was... Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of the product itself, but it was some kind of, you know, somebody had gone and built this, you know, third party plugin thing that Jared found and uh, we kind of tweaked it and hacked it together. So uh, great, great ecosystem story. Um, Nelson, I was just looking because you have a ton of content on nearbound.com uh, and a lot of it is stuff that's just shared from your own partner principles that you're building up. And I was looking at um, one of the articles on there. A I think it's called a major lesson in building partnerships from zero to 150 million. And the first line in there, I didn't realize this. I mean, I knew you knew what you were talking about, but it says you have built five partner programs from zero to one mm -hmm. that have driven 150 million ARR. Like that's not, you know, it's luck if it happens once. It's like coincidence if it happens twice, <laughs> five times, there's a pattern here. Like you are an absolute pro at this. And I think that's that's kind of rare. Like a lot of people are in partnerships are in their first or second role, but to be doing this over and over and over again, mm. like you've got to love it and you've got to know what you're doing. Give me, how did you get to this point? Like, how have you been able to repeat this? I know that's a huge question, but I would love to get uh, kind of your, your quick take on that. I would preface this by saying I made a huge amount of mistakes along the way in the journey. So it was a like a learning process all the way through and very experiential. And the what really drove me on it is I love to build. So for me, it's like diving into something new, really learning from ground zero, uh, especially experientially and through mentors as well. It was like something that was super enjoyable. So going from one company to another to do it was fun, even though some of the principles would be the same. I also love to learn about like different industries or platforms or different go to markets and so forth and different customers. And I think that's really what motivated me to go do it at different companies five different times. But a big part of it was also stubbing my toe quite a bit and having a lot of failures and learning from those as rapidly as possible. And one of the biggest shifts I think about when I look back over those five programs is this big pivot point where I realized the tactics that I were, was doing were certainly very effective. Things like, you know, outreach campaigns or webinars or, you know, call blitzes, et cetera. And I kind of staked my career on that early on by executing a lot of tactics. 
But what really changed the game is going from tactics to principles. And I was mentored by someone on this right. who helped me to take a step back and to say, what are like the core principles that really make up a great partner program? And then layered on top of that, what are the frameworks to go drive it to be successful? And once I really understood that and had a much more customer-centric lens built on core principles, it became very clear to me how to build much more efficient, scalable, successful partner programs for the long term from zero to one. And I immediately stopped doing the, hey, this partner playbook worked at this other company, let's bring it over. And instead, I would say, let's start with the core principles, go meet with a customer, understand their journey, their pain, how we can help them. And then from there, we can go build a great partner program, no matter what company, what industry, what customer it is. And so for me, that was like the really big turning point in the whole process. Oh my gosh. I am uh, so excited just hearing you say that. It resonates so well with me that it's like the tactics change. You have to be nimble with tactics and you have mm -hmm. to kind of know like what's new, what's changing, what can you experiment with and test. The principles don't. And it's, it's often that, like you said, most of us start with tactics. And then after we find that we can't get them to repeat, never, all of a sudden we stumble into, okay, hold on. There's got to be something more fundamental. There's got to be something unchanging that undergirds the changeable. Mm -hmm. And I just love the way that you frame that in, in this little article, uh, Jared, I know you have something you want to say, but I, I just, I have to go, go into this. Well, you just I give these three principles here, um, which are really killer. You're like, okay, here's what you're going to do to start from zero. Number one, interview your top customers and hear from them to figure out what partners are going to be the most relevant. So I love it. It's like, first, talk to your customers. Number two, talk to your cross-functional teams. And then number three, talk to the partners that your customers are already working with. And I love that because it's easy to start with, okay, I got to build a partner program. Who are all the cool, amazing partners that I want to go get? Who do I want? Who do I think would be cool? What do, what do I imagine would be good for the company? And you're turning that around and saying, first thing, go talk to the customer, go talk to your teams and go talk to the partners that are already in your ecosystem. And it's like, it sounds so simple, but like, again, these are the principles that always, if you come back to, uh, you're, you know, you're going to get the reward from it. So anyway, you're just getting me all hyped up. Love it. I, I love the, um, uh, I love the dedication to first principles. I mean, Isaac, if there's one thing that you and I might be known for in this podcast is that we try to ground things in like, Hey, what are the fundamentals? What are the first principles? What are the undeniable things? Hmm. Because, uh, you know, I have these phrases that I say all the time and I say, th I've said this phrase before, I'd rather say the same, you know, 10 things a thousand times than a thousand things, 10 times. Right. right. And why? Because mastering something and really truly understanding and grappling with it. I mean, that was really what I was trying to do. And Isaac, you were helping to do with the book was like, what's really more fundamental here about this shift, about what we're doing and why this moment for Nearbound and partnerships that is our cross-functional are there. And, and Nelson, it's so funny whenever I read you, that you wrote that, probably one of my funniest rants is, uh, I think it was at Partnership Leaders Conference. There was like this clip that uh, went around where I was like, if you can't put W's on the board with the partners that your customers already use, then you shouldn't have a job. Like, it's really that simple. It's not about going out and building some esoteric theoretical list in this complex thing. Like, no, who are your top 10, 20, 50, 100 customers? Who do they already do business with? If those people can't be your partners, nobody can be your partners. Nobody can at every single company. I don't care what stage. And if it's a new market or a new territory, then go talk to those ideal customers. They'll, they'll tell you about their business if you're not selling them anything. It's not that hard. So I love that you started there. It's just so fundamentally true. And I think where you get much more alignment with the organization as a whole, where you actually understand the context of the customer. And I think it's surprisingly overlooked quite a bit. And I would encourage folks in partnerships to do it right off the bat when they step into a role, which is uh, reach out to your cross-functional team members, uh, whether it be sales or CSMs are a great example, because you know, they're there to make the customers super successful and the uh, ongoing support and, you know, the ongoing uh, adoption of your platform. And that's a great way to basically get that customer interview and ask them, like, what does your journey look like? Or show them a visual like, hey, this is what we think the journey is from what we've heard from some folks. Is this accurate? And if so, as you go through the journey, like, what are the biggest pain points that you're running into? And what's the business impact that you're going to face as you go through those pain points? 
And that part's really important too, because what I found is um, sometimes you need a really long list of things, but then you wanna be able to quickly and qualitatively identify of those lists of pain points, which are the ones that really move the needle for the business that they wanna go solve for um, you know, quickly. And then you have a really clear view of, okay, these are the key priorities we need to go address with our partner types. And to your point, when you talk about that part, which is who are the partners that customers are already working with, that's a, a great accelerant to quickly go and you know, work with that partner, go make it formalized, and you know, start to replicate and scale that over time. So yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I think that is absolutely a, a, a great way to find what we call a partner market fit like really quickly. And then ultimately, you want to formulate an IPP off of that and then be able to scale it to other partners that you think will be a good fit in your ecosystem. Nelson, uh, I know that your partner principles um, you know, newsletter that you've, you've launched, it's not that well. We launched this, what, like within a year, a year ago or so, maybe? I think less than a year. Yeah, a few months. Less than a year. Yeah. Okay. So you've been at this for a long time. You obviously know what you're doing. You were kind of, I was asking you before, and then I said, actually, hold off. Let's talk about this on the podcast. What prompted you to launch this, to start sharing these learnings, to start kind of like moving into that role of mentor, of teacher? Um, I'm just curious what, what prompted that and, and what motivates you to, to keep putting out so much stuff? Yeah, so um, this is a personal uh, story that I'm sharing. But when I first joined uh, tech and also in partnerships, um, I came out of a training program at Cisco. I was there from like North Carolina for a year doing training. And then I went into the field for partnerships um, covering Northern California. And I got um, a mentor assigned to me, um, but also like he voluntarily raised his hand for it. And he took me in. I was new to San Francisco, new to the team, new to partnerships, new to tech. And he treated me like a big brother. It, it was life changing. Like he would basically coach me not only on partnerships, but even life lessons as well. And like, we were really, really close. And I thought of him as like a big brother, basically. I never had a brother growing up. And um, one of the really sad things to talk about is he passed away uh, very young from, um, you know, cancer. And it was really sad. Um, and, and that was something that just kind of rocked my world when it happened, of course. And I remember um, actually being at his uh, funeral and he had, there was this like video montage of his life. And one of the core messages he wanted to pass on was at the very end of the video. And what he said is he wanted to, you know, make sure that this message was given out to the audience about paying it forward. Um, and I believe the words he used was, you know, passing the torch forward or, or something similar to that. And as I've gotten older, that's something I really think about, which is, you know, I think it's great that I've done like close to, I think it's like 18 years now in partnerships and, and a bit of marketing in there as well. But I would feel really bad if like I didn't pass on these lessons to other folks to make their lives easier, to help them be more successful and to teach so many of these lessons that I had to learn the hard way, um, you know, through many different companies and many different mentors along the way. Um, I would have loved it if one person just had all those lessons consolidated into a set of, you know, principles and frameworks and templates and videos so that I could just kind of get it all in one go and instantly be much more successful and, you know, get to value significantly faster. So that's the personal reason like that really drives me to want to do this. And it's why I can do things like I, I like I wrote um, content for a year, uh, a year supply um, and I batched it. It's because it's something I'm really passionate about. And I think if I didn't have that underlying motivation and passion to pay it forward and share lessons, then it would be so hard to write like that much content um, as an example. So that's really what drives the, the whole process of, of doing this. Man, I, I love that. I, the, the passion is so evidently there. And you have such a like, you just have like a calm about you. Like you just sort of know what you want to say, what you're doing. And you have like a very, I don't know, like a calming presence. I'm like, I just want to listen. Like, Nelson, <laughs> tell me what to do. But the passion is there. The experience is there. And then just what you mentioned, having a backlog of a year and the way, because I know we've worked with you on, you know, publishing some of your content and I've looked at what you're doing. You are such an organized, like systematic thinker, clearly, like kind of the, the way you're you're getting your content out there. You would be, uh, I know you said you worked in marketing a little bit. You'd be amazing at running a content marketing machine because you have such a well-organized process too. So anyway, that's just a huge plug for following following all the stuff that, uh, that Nelson's putting out there. Really, 
really thoughtful. It's not just like, hey, let me go go do some off the cuff LinkedIn posts about what I learned today or what I've learned in my career. This is like really thoughtfully put together a whole kind of catalog um, for people new to the role. So very much appreciated. And, and yeah, no, I, maybe oh, go ahead, go ahead, Nelson. Oh, oh uh, so what I was going to quickly say is um, the way like I organized it was basically I broke down all the topics I could think of that I've worked on in the past and then categorize that in Airtable and then, um, you know, have things like the marketing campaign tied to it or the, or the partner and then also the content and the visuals, and then they'll have columns for each of those. And then basically we'll try to schedule multiple posts through the LinkedIn scheduling um, tool to be able to get all, get it all out there. So Airtable has like been a really big part of creating this operating system to go drive getting this content out there in a very um, data-driven way and also systems-oriented way so that it's less like, hey, I need to write like, you know, one post today and, and then I get writer's block and it's really painful. And where did that post go? And where's the content for that? All of that's tracked in Airtable. And then I look at also the KPIs around things like impressions and likes and comments that really help me understand, does this add value? Do people like it? You know, are they telling me it's helpful? And then it helps me orient around the right content moving forward as well. It's incredible. You're running a one-man marketing team over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of work for sure, but it's like nights and weekends, something I'm super passionate about. And, uh, you know, uh, it's just, it's been a lot of fun. It's been cool to see the response. Well, the the story that you were just telling, I mean, uh, th thank you so much for sharing that on, on the show. And, and one of the um, story in the story that you were mentioning, kind of like when we were catching up before the call, Nelson, you, you mentioned this word, which was like, you know, this fostering this sense of like, uh, collaboration or cooperation, and obviously kind of like giving back after having these runs. Um, uh, it, it's funny because right before this, and I don't know why I was, I mean, it was just like on YouTube on my background, I was, I went down this deep rabbit hole on like these deep explainer videos on game theory. Have you ever studied game theory, Nelson? Uh, lightly, um, mainly related to one specific topic. And I'm, I primarily learned it actually from Twitter, but I wouldn't say I'm the expert on it. <laughs> Well, it, it was funny because I won't I won't go down too much of a rabbit hole, but I, I thought it was funny in like the spirit of like cooperation and collaboration. There's this famous study, um, and what it talks about is like, hey, they fed these computer programs like this nice versus naughty kind of like prisoner, prisoner's dilemma. Like, should you cooperate or should you defect? Right? Should you like, hey, I'm gonna go take what's mine, right? Or should you cooperate? And what ends up happening is that you know, if you get one point if you defect, but you get more if you cooperate, right? So like, hmm. um, you'd think whenever you run these experiments across, let's say 15, you know, strategies and then 50 strategies and what happens over time is phenomenal. Uh, that the, the top 50 percentile of all these different strategies, whether it's the top seven or it's the top 25 each time have a cooperative approach. And it's funny because of all the most complex programs. So you mentioned simplicity versus, you know, like principles versus complexity. Do you know the, the program that wins the most over any other strategy in game theory. It's called tit for tat. And you know what tit for tat means? Tit for tat means, and it's actually tit for tat generous, meaning uh, about one out of 10 times when someone defects on you, you still are nice back. But that means that you're nice by default, you're collaborative by default, but you punch back whenever you're punched. That's all that it means. Tit for tat is like that, but then you default nice, right? You're always, you never open with a negative move, but out of the hundreds and hundreds of simulations, default cooperation, but then being able to stand your ground and not being a pushover. I just thought it was funny that like the most simplistic program of all the complex ones that they made, mm. right? Defaulted to collaboration. It wasn't complex and it had this healthy spirit and the top 50 percentile these were the nice group, not the naughty group. They had a spirit of collaboration, not a spirit of well, defecting. Uh, Jared, I'm gonna, this may be an interesting uh, connection to a, a, another adjacent topic because I know with a lot of those simulations that they run, if you only run it one time, if it's a one-shot game, then the payoff is always better if you defect, right? If I just steal your stuff, I lie to you, mm -hmm. I take your stuff, mm -hmm. one-shot game. Mm -hmm. A repeat game, that strategy gets worse and worse because you get a bad yep. reputation. No one will trade with you again, blah, 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 blah. And the more repetitions there are, the more it pays off to collaborate versus. And so it makes me think about in the job market, if people's average tenure is like 18 months in a lot of these roles, how much does that make it difficult to incentivize sort of long-term collaborative thinking? If it's like, I'm hitting my numbers this quarter or this year, 
I don't care if I burn bridges for the future, I'm out of here. Or conversely, as a lot of partner people will complain about that they're, they want to play long-term games, but they're getting all this pressure to just like go squeeze leads out of a partner today or kick them to the curb. So anyway, I'm curious, uh, Nelson, maybe tying together this concept of like that simple principle, it sounds great, it sounds simple, but the time frame matters, right? Yeah, and I think it's so important to do that over the long term, like you mentioned. And it, it actually, um, it reminds me of a line I read in your book, Jared, about the way in which you build trust is by giving value. I'm probably not doing a perfect uh, uh, summary of it, but effectively, that's what I recall. And I think it's so important to constantly give and show value and demonstrate you're here to help and show how you actually do that and execute on it. And then ultimately, you build that trust that leads to success for the long term. So um, as you were talking through it, it kind of reminded me of that specific statement within your book. Um, but I couldn't agree more. I think for the long term, you've really got to just continually help and build that trust and build that relationship. And that's really what drives long term success. And, so, and, so question for you, yeah, Nelson. So when you've started some of these programs from you know zero or essentially zero, how do you balance? Got to get some quick wins on the board so that I can have trust within my organization with, I have to build this long-term trust. I have to think, you know, down the road and mm -hmm. it's not always mm -hmm. going to be instant payoff. That's, that's mm -hmm. a very common challenge uh, that people face when they're in that stage. Yeah. Um, so the way I would think about it is uh, maybe sharing a story, like very commonly stepping into a new role for partnerships. Uh, one of the most common requests right off the bat is, I want more leads and I want more revenue source like immediately. And so those are kind of like those short-term wins that are often ass. And I think the key is uh, not just stepping into that right away, which by the way, I have done. So <laughs> someone's asked me that before and I'm like, yep, I'm going to get you revenue right away. Let's go make a thousand calls with our partners and go find some business. Um, which by the way, tactically that that's not very successful anymore. That was way back in the day. Um, and so that's like very short term specific. And what I do differently now is I say, before we get into these quick wins right away and, and you know trying to get something on the board, I'm all for that. We do want partner market fit, we do wanna get wins, but we need to first properly assess. This is really, really critical in the phased approach of building great programs, which is we need to step in here and look at both qualitative and quantitative to identify what good looks like for our company and most importantly for our customers. And what I mean by that, so specifically like in the assessment period, qualitatively, you'd want to sit down with your, let's call it top 10, 20, 50 customers, whatever that number you think is meaningful based on, you know, ARR spend, uh, potential lifetime value, et cetera, um, or maybe adoption. It just depends on what key metrics you're looking at. And then really understand their journey and their pain and then how you can help them. That's a qualitative side. And, I would take like copious notes on that, right? So like if it's a customer interview, it's not, you know, just a couple of responses. It's literally an hour interview where you deep dive into what are their pain points? What's the business impact? What technology stacks are they using? What is current to future state look like? What does, you know, the ideal state look like, et cetera? Uh, and who are the current partners already working with? So that's a qualitative side, but that is so important because when you go through the qualitative, you deeply empathize with your customer you really understand the problem set and the pain. You're able to identify where the business impact is happening. And then I think one really key thing that's interesting about that is you hear their language they use. And that is so important because when you go downstream and you start to build a partner program and you go recruit partners and enable them and co-sell with them, you want to use that same customer language that you learned about with your partners to go then bring it back to customers. Mm -hmm. It's such a small nuance but I think it makes a huge difference because uh, and I'll give you an example. I did 60 uh, enterprise customer meetings last year uh, with or for our partners, depending on the situation. And what I found is using their language was very, very important. And in fact, uh, in one meeting, someone had mentioned how important that specifically was to them. So uh, that's just an example of how critical the qualitative assessment component is. And then on the quantitative side, it's looking at things like, Hey, you know, share information with me that allows me to form my ICP, like stack rank on ARR or segment or, you know, vertical uh, and so forth, you know, economic buyer and so forth. And then looking at things like cohort analysis, for example, here's, you know, what our customers look like in AR spend and, you know, net retention and gross retention 
without partners versus with a specific partner type. And let's look at the data and analysis around that to better form an opinion on what our ideal partner profile would look like. Um, so I went into the deep end on this, but my point is like going through that assessment period is hugely important so that you build the right strategy for the long term. And you're not just trying to take down the short term wins, but ultimately it's not scalable, right? So as an example, uh, I'll just be very um, specific. I could go to our, you know, uh, three to five existing partners and say, hey, I'm going to give you all a quota. I need you to find three new source seals. And that's the new program. Let's just go do it. And then maybe you get a couple of source seals. But is that really a sustainable partner program if it's not customer centric? And you'll notice um, by doing that, that could be very company centric, right? That's what we may want as a company, but is that customer centric? And what I find is the more customer obsessed you are, the more you start there and solve their pain, all the other things downstream will take care of itself, including company performance and partner performance as well. And um, a good example of this is like if your customers have explored a solution, your solution is a bit complex. It requires a lot of services around that. Well, hey, if you plug in your partners to do those services, you've dri driven down potentially services costs on your side. You're also able to serve more customers and they're happy and they're getting to the outcome. They're going to grow. And then there's ARR growth, better net retention, better adoption on use, uh, users and so forth. So super long winded answer, but I think it's a really important one because I run into this many times of having those short term goal expectations, but then um, being able to say, hey, let's take a step back and just make sure we're properly building and it's setting that expectation at the executive level and then getting yourself the time you need to properly do the assessment phase, the planning phase, the execution, um, then allows you to have a partner program that's set up for success for the long term. Okay. Um, Nelson, I was just uh, actually taking some notes and typing to Isaac because uh, it's like, yeah, you know what Jared typed? I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what Jared typed to me. By the way, I'm surprised <laughs> he was able to because without his glasses, Jared is blind as a bat. So yeah, I guess kind of right guessing now. at the no, but he typed a little chat over here. He's like, I'm leaving notes to myself. And he says, He gets it. Oh my god, we need hundreds more of him. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's a part of principles is for. Yeah, let's get hundreds of more people behind this idea of principles. I think it would really help. A hundred percent. I mean, like that, that's why I felt it was so important that, you know, what is near bound in a word is, is surround, but who are we surrounding? The customer, mm -hmm. the customer, mm -hmm. yep. right? Totally. Like, you know, the best entrepreneurs I know speak about this from the perspective of being customer obsessed, right? Like every single great entrepreneur, if they're not customer obsessed, they're not a great entrepreneur. You don't know them, right? Like maybe they had a flash in the pan and they got lucky, but you know, enduring businesses are customer obsessed. And I think enduring leadership is customer obsessed. And that is just as true, if not more true with partnerships than any other function or role. So everything that you just said right there was spot on, Nelson. And I want to tie together what you mentioned about value because the uh, I don't think I use the word value in the book per se, but what I say is that trust comes from helping people reach their promised land. And what you were just talking about in that mm. exercise, with the short versus long-term gains, right? is okay well what is their promised land where are they going if you do not know where your customers are going how are you supposed to help them get there okay mm -hmm. now where is your partner's promised land where are your partners going if you do not know where your partners are going how are you supposed to help them get there that's the definition of value is your ability to help people achieve their objectives as a company as a leader as a business period and that's where revenue generating activities should come from, right? That equation. Okay, I have an intimate understanding of my customers' challenges and needs, and I'm going to help them get there. And I'm going to connect them with folks that are good at helping them get there. And you know what? I'm, I'm capable and fully able to make hard asks in the pursuit of that. Right. It's not that like you're a pushover and it's like, oh, I'm out here giving everywhere to everyone all the time and I make no money for my company. No, no, no. It's that I'm an expert. You know, we had the Jocko podcast um, a couple of weeks ago, Isaac. It's like, you know, be passionate, be an expert. That doesn't mean you can't make hard ass and make money. But if you're not an expert, good luck making hard ass for money. That's 100 percent spot on. And uh, it reminds me of a great podcast that I just listened to with um Greg, who is the CPO over at uh, uh, Ernst & Young, or EY. And then he talked about this Greg concept Serafin. of like, yeah, Greg Serafin, yeah. He talked about this concept of outside in, which is exactly what you described, which is really being focused on what is the customer trying to get to as an outcome? And then how do you orchestrate 
all the partners and vendors to be able to go deliver on that solution that gets them to the outcome. And when I read your book about the, uh, the line about the promise line, um, that's something that triggered that thought as well. So it, it's absolutely, I think, the way we should be oriented. And if we start there, we'll then know which are the right partners to go work with to go help them get to that outcome. And that really ultimately is the most important part. If we can do that, then the value exchange will be fair. Customers will be more than happy to pay. And uh, you know, it's because they're much more successful and they're getting to those specific business outcomes that are critical to them. Yeah, and th that's where like be be bold in your pursuit of customer outcomes, right? Like what what I see between varsity players like Nelson, like this point should not be lost on any listener. The difference between a varsity player like Nelson is because of this expertise and passion for the space and customer centricity. You know, whenever he makes an ask of his ecosystem or of his company, you know what they do? They listen, right? And it's not that you're kowtowing, giving out help to people like, oh, I'm just the most helpful person at the company. Like, please let me have a job here. It's that, you know, boldness, right? Because you have some expertise in the, the persona, the role of being a partner leader, but then also the customer centricity. I mean, let's be honest. Are you using Airtable right now? Yes, that's kind of my point. You know, like you gotta be passionate and like, live in the space where your customers live. You're using it at partner principles, which makes you, I think, an even better partner leader. And I think we have to have that um, tacit experience when it comes to being able to help customers put ourselves in the customer's shoes. And then whenever we do make asks, it's like, yeah, because I know what I'm asking for. I know what I'm talking about. I want to help. And you, you're much more trustworthy than someone that's just trying to give you tchotchkes at a conference. Like, oh, I sent you a bottle of wine. It's like, hey, I haven't been drinking for a couple of months. Like, you don't know me. Like, I'm not going to do anything with that bottle of wine. You know, like <laughs> giving doesn't matter. Helping does. Yeah. It, um, yeah. I, I also want to just call out for those listening, like, hey, you want to you want to be successful. You want to get where Nelson is. You just mentioned you did 60 calls last year with customer. You say 60 customer calls, right? Of mm -hmm. Enterprise customers. So that's in addition to talking with all the partners and everything. 60 calls last year with customers. I don't, I don't think a lot of partner people are doing that or are thinking nope. that way. Not so enough. like, this is, this is one of the big challenges. I know this role, it's like, you got to know what your sales team is up to. You got to know what your marketing team is up to. You got to know what your success team is up to. That's a lot of meetings. That's a lot of communication. You got to know what your customers are up to. A lot of meetings, a lot of communication. Oh, and then there's all your partners, right? Like, I know it's a lot, but that's where I think the principles come in because that that's what helps you prioritize. When you can come back to some of those principles where it's like, okay, there's too much stuff for me to do all of it. I can't treat everyone equally, can't treat every task equally. So I'm curious for you when it comes to kind of like real practical, like time management, how do you mm -hmm. determine that it's worth 60 customer calls and what are you sacrificing to do that? And how, you know, internally, how much are you spending mm -hmm. time with each of the mm -hmm. teams versus with your partner? <clears throat> Those are really tough decisions to make. And if you have any mm -hmm. kind of like frameworks or rules of thumb that help you with your allocation of time. I think it still comes down to being really clear on of all the things that you could work on. Uh, what are the up to probably three things max that really move the needle on business impact? And it'll also vary based on the stage you're in with the company, meaning the partnership strategy at a company from zero to call it 10 million ARR is going to be uh, pretty different than 10 million, a hundred, and then a hundred million plus also very, very different. Right. And especially if you get very large, having been at big companies myself, um, like Cisco and VMware, their partner programs and go to market, very mature, very structured, totally different. So I think you've got to be able to look at your priorities in each of those different stages and make the call on where to focus. And I'm a really big believer in it's important to say no, because especially at startups and especially in PLG, <laughs> you're going to get like, in many cases, hundreds, if not thousands of partner requests and not just, you know, one partner type, but potentially like six different partner types. And that could mean six different partner programs, six different partner go to motions, et cetera. And what is really important is not to try to do all of them. It's to anchor on the customer, understand the journey and the pain, and then say which of those, and maybe it's just even one, is going to make the biggest impact to the customer and downstream our company and our partners. And that's the one we're gonna go spend a lot of energy, resourcing, focus um, on to make successful. And so 
Um, that's typically the way I try to think about it. That's like the high level version. Certainly if we like dive into the specifics, there's like KPIs you would, you know, think about um, measuring against to, to really decide what to go after and so forth. But at a high level, that's how I think about it. Yeah, it's it's so funny how simple that is, but the recognition of the stage of the company just so important. And if you've been at companies of different stages, kind of bringing that, hey, we're scrappy, like everything's urgent, urgent, urgent mindset. To then you move to a different company. Uh, that's that's a that's a that's a key point. Um, no, I, I, it's interesting. You have to remain flexible with kind of like not only the company you're at, but where the company, like maybe this quarter, there's a really, really key priority and you have to kind of push everything else back and saying, no, I know the type of person that's attracted to partnerships is the type of person that likes to say yes. and doesn't like to say no. <laughs> like to get along with everybody and be friendly. Funny, yeah. I think that's really one of the biggest things is like, no, it's not because I don't like you. It's not because I don't want to partner, but no, I don't have the bandwidth, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's spot on. Uh, that's definitely me. <laughs> like early on in my career, I was such a people pleaser and like would try to do everything. And like people would ask me something, I'd be like, I'm on it. And I just, I just work until like late into the night to get it done. Um, and I, I still come with the same intensity on things that matter though, right? Like what ultimately really moves the needle and don't try to just do everything for the sake of every request. And, and just because you want to check every single um, box on the list. Um, so I think that is uh, really, really important is learn to say no and then focus your energy on on what's really going to make the difference. Well, the, kind of the inverse of like a partner of, of a first principle is like, you know, like a first principle that you're more predisposed to that you may or may not be aware of. And this is one that I, I think I talked about a lot earlier on in the podcast, but I haven't brought up recently. And I call it SOS, Nelson, or shiny object syndrome or starry eyed syndrome. Mm. And I, I think the partner professionals and entrepreneurs, at least the ones that are you know, junior, right? It's like, hey, I'm, I'm gonna take the leap into partnerships or I'm gonna take the leap into becoming an entrepreneur. Everything looks like an opportunity, which therefore means that nothing is an opportunity because the most misunderstood word in startups, in my opinion, is strategy. Like you've heard the phrase culture eats strategy for breakfast, you know, like, okay, Paul Graham, great. I kind of agree with that. But the reality is, is that like strategy is just choice, you know, like, do all of your choices assume no value? So like what you're saying, whenever you're out there, like, oh, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. What that means is that you're not able to make decisions and decisions is where progress is made. It's where resources are allocated. Like there's money going out of your company's bank account. Presumably not all of those dollars are equal. There's money coming into your company's bank account. Presumably not all of those dollars are equal and you have to be able to assign a weight to it. So your ability to make good decisions, right, to, to say no to things because the, the value of them is less, right? The cost to them may be higher. The impact of the business may be less is the ultimate separator from what, you know, makes junior varsity players versus varsity players. And so like saying no, absolutely. And as we're predisposed in this profession where there's tons of opportunity. There's, there's too much opportunity. So you have to say no. Otherwise, you become what? You become the meme of the partnerships professional, right? right? That we all know too well that you're out there doing so much, but what's the outcome? Well, that, there can be a, a tendency, especially when, if you feel like the market's getting tight and maybe your job is, you're not so secure in your job to be like, well, if I just do a ton of activities, then I can come and say, look, here's this huge list of things that I did, like activities that I did. And I'm going to tell you, that's, that's not going to save you. Okay. SDR. <laughs> you know? Here, here's, here's a couple partners and we did a couple things with them and we did them well. And we actually drove results. And I know that's like, it's, it feels safe to go just stack up the quantity, but it's not going to get you anywhere. That's right. And I, I think the key is like, what are the key results that it actually led to that really mattered? And that's really what it should anchor on. And ultimately, if you take care of the customer, those metrics should take care of themselves. Um, so, and, and one thing I would add is, um, you know, I think part of it is also, yes, you do this assessment, you get customer validation as quickly as possible. And, and then I think the other piece is you want to test with your partner for partner market fit quickly from there too, by doing things that uh, ultimately don't scale in the beating to get to scale later on. So certainly execution is helpful, especially in the early stages to quickly validate. And I think the key there is like, you know, you want to quickly understand, hey, if this is not working, we need to make the changes and iterate and 
continuously improve and not just double down and pile up all this activity and just hope it works out. I think that's the the key balance is you're trying to validate as quickly as possible and then you can go make additional investments from there. Um, and that co- partly ties to like the, the 60 customer calls I did. Like why I did that is I just wanted to be really, really sure that the process and the approach um, was directionally correct. And then the second part was I also wanted to understand the dynamics of how that customer engagement would go, right? So like the initial meeting, the proposal stage, getting them to move forward, um, et cetera. And by like going through that in a very unscalable fashion was incredibly eye-opening because I would see upfront what worked, what didn't, and then I'd be able to pass this feedback directly to our partners who continuously improve with us as well. And then over time, you know, I was able to step away and then our partners could take those learnings and go to market themselves with a high success rate. And it it was just like one anecdote on this as an example. I remember one of our partners, we started on like a proposal process that was like V1. And then we had two iterations based on feedback from the customer and our engagements working on uh, that we worked on together with that partner. And by V3, it was like massively different and it was so much better. And I had breakfast with that uh, partner recently and it was like just incredibly um, eye-opening to see the change that has happened since our first, you know, interaction together and how much we've improved along the way. So um, I think part of it is like doing those things that are unscalable to get to scale is really critical, especially in the early stages of a program. And ultimately you're doing that to, to learn and also to quickly validate partner market fit. Uh, Nelson, one of the things that is probably the most common from partner partner pros is I just don't have the buy-in from leadership. And you have this nice little uh, how I present strategy to CXOs and boards. And it's it's a really short little uh, article and you've got these three points. Leverage the Amazon memo approach, yeah. give feedback on uh, what they view as priorities and then practice, practice, practice. I love this. You said I once practiced for three hours in a hotel room prior to a CXO. <laughs> <laughs> but Give me a quick, what is the Amazon memo approach and what is the process of getting feedback? Because not everyone's at this stage, but I think thinking about getting that buy-in and sharing your strategy with the C-suite and doing that well, I would love to hear uh, kind of those those little tips you have there. Yeah. And this ties back to what Jared uh, mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, so ultimately, you're not trying to just highlight activity for the sake of activity. Um, and you don't want to use adjectives that are like, this was great, or this was fantastic. You want to back it up with concrete data. So we did these three initiatives, and this specifically led to partner revenue growing by X percent quarter over quarter. And we noticed in the cohort that our customers worked with these partners, net retention increased by X, Y, Z, right? And so what it does is it provides a tremendous amount of clarity to put that into writing in a very data-driven way that is very straightforward. And it's less about like these fancy visuals you can put on a uh, slide and more about just give me the core data and tell me what's working, where do we double down, what isn't working, how do we improve on that? And ultimately how did the activities and initiatives that you worked on actually lead to real business outcomes that matter for our customers and then downstream for the company and your partners? And then the other key piece of this is once you crystallize those thoughts, put it on paper, which by the way, writing memos, I think is a great process that I encourage everyone to go to go through to get clarity. You then share that in advance and folks do that in a uh, reading session together. And why that's really critical is because it ensures that everyone actually reads it because we're all doing it together in that moment because we all get really busy. Right? You've got family, you've got other meetings that pile up, um, urgent deals that take place, et cetera. And so you block out that time and you actually go through it together. People start marking up with questions and comments and so forth. And then you're able to then discuss um, and potentially and hopefully make decisions quickly to be able to then move the ball forward from there. So I think that's really critical. Um, one last thing I mentioned, this is kind of like a, an add-on bonus that I, I think is really helpful. What I find really helpful, in addition to all the data and the summary points you'll have in the memo, I think it's so powerful to have customer stories ready and specifically be able to talk about the customer 
problem, the solution, and then the outcome you drove. And it's because what I have found is to win the hearts and minds of folks, people remember stories. The data is helpful, like it, it makes it concrete, but ultimately when you tell the story about how you helped one of your biggest customers and you got them to the outcome and you share, for example, like a video testimonial where they're just like overjoyed and they say, wow, this partner really made a huge difference. I mean, you really end up winning hearts and minds. So that's something I think a lot about too is uh, you really have to learn to be a great storyteller and have that ready at your fingertips. And you know, if you if you want, prepare a couple stories or slides on that in advance, uh, and then practice ahead, and it can really make a huge difference. I, I love that, Isaac. Thank you so much for bringing that up because, it, like Nelson, what you just described was a masterclass on how to get that executive alignment. And um, for folks that want to practice this and get good at it, I highly encourage uh, everyone to pick up a copy of a fen phenomenal read, Working Backwards. So that's working backwards is the inside story of Amazon. And they detail how like they actually run this entire operation and I actually use this at Drift to secure a multi-million dollar investment in our partner program. Like I literally did the PR FAQ, Nelson, like where like I wrote the, the relaunch of our partner program as a press release with frequently asked questions in a six page memo format. And yes, I had data and I had stories, but it really had everything self-contained. And, you know, that made my CFO have to sit down and like really wrestle with it. Like, go, okay, mm -hmm. well, here's the presentation that we had, but like, this is what we're launching. Mm -hmm. And told in that narrative format, almost like a press release, you know, announcing today, mm -hmm. you know, Drift does blah, 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 blah. Like, uh, I, I think it's a phenomenal, phenomenal, you know, way of going about doing business and then obviously practicing. Um, I, I want to end with one thing, Nelson, because this has been like, kind of like, the first principles episode, partner principles, if you will, right? Um, which I love, uh, you know, Isaac and I could talk first principles all day across every vector is what might share with us, what might've been the most counterintuitive partner principle that you've uncovered? Like what's something hmm. that like kind of stands out to you that you're like, this is not readily apparent on the surface, but it's always served me well uh, in the realm of partnerships. Cause I feel like we're an industry full of those kind of, you know, dichotomies and paradoxes, so to speak, things that might be counterintuitive uh, are the things that end up, you know, more often than not working. Ooh, that's a great question. I love that one. Um, I, I can't think of one that's like counterintuitive right off the top of my head. Um, but a common theme I've seen in the past has been more is good. And, uh, but I think a lot of people would, would agree, especially folks that have done partnerships a few times would say uh, that is not always the case. Uh, often, quite often, um, usually just not. And uh, what I've found is that quality really matters. Having a very high quality bar, doing things with care, with deep empathy and like, you know, a lot of thought um, and validation in a customer centric way goes a, a significant way further than trying to do just more on the surface of doing more. And so I don't think that's super counterintuitive though, but well, it's just something that I personally experience that I think is really important to highlight. I'll pull that thread with you to kind of maybe end the point that I think why the essence of what you just said is so true is that is humans are really terrible at understanding compound interest and compound gains right? You don't start compound gains. It, like the yield curve is in, or the, the curve is inverted in most people's minds, all the activity and everything up front. And then more gains come later. No, it starts really small with really highly impactful things. And then the volume comes over time, right? You can stack, you know, more bricks on top of a solid foundation than you can, you know, on sticks or on hay. And you have to really nail that quality first. Like, so if you're trying to build an ecosystem, well, like you should probably win in an ecosystem, for example, right? Like get that alliance really cooking and then show, okay, now we have shown how we can w win inside of an ecosystem. How do we bring some of those partners inside to uh, build our own, right? Same thing with platform, right? You don't build a platform strategy, like a true platform strategy by launching just an API. No, it has to be a platform. You know, like API and integrations, these are two separate things. You can have an integration strategy. So I think that quality, it is somewhat counterintuitive because we don't understand compound interest as humans. We don't understand that like, hey, I can play, you know, most humans overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in three. Yeah, what? that's a good point. Oh, oh, go ahead, Isaac. No, I was just going to say the, in addition to the compound interest for the company that you're at and the fact that that may take time to pay off, 
it also goes with you personally in your career, right? Wherever you go, it follows you. So the way mm. that you built partnerships, the way that you did things, mm. you know, apart from maybe three years later, you're not at that company anymore. And you're like, oh, well, I don't care. But it, it stays with you. If you mm-hmm, did it right, mm-hmm. you're going to have compound interest down the road through all kinds of things that you, through those, the relationships you built, the trust that you have. And if you didn't, then you're, you're going to lose all that. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, totally. And, and like, um, I think if I could share like one quick story on this, a uh, good example is um, I remember one year I recruited uh, like 700 partners in a year and I, I felt so proud of that <laughs> wow. in the moment. But then when we look back at the data, what we found is like the Pareto principle definitely applied. And so that, that's like a big lesson for me. Not, not as many programs ago, but it taught me to really slow down and think about what really matters to the customer, get to know them, and then, and then go work backwards from there. So uh, I know I've kind of <laughs> talked about that topic quite a bit, but um, it's a good example of like though. where, you know, qu- quantity is not necessarily always the answer. Really think about quality and how you're getting people to the outcome. and uh, you can ramp up that quality over time to get some more quantity and, and, and that will f- be far more important than just rushing for quantity in the beginning. Get good at doing the things that work and ignore the things that don't, you know, like right. wrestle exactly. with that same topic over and over again and master the yep. thing that actually moves the needle. Um, Nelson, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Folks listening to this, we need hundreds of of you more out there in the, the market, like uh, follow Nelson's stuff. It's incredible. I love how he thinks about partnerships and his track records. Uh, phenomenal. And I, obviously I'm a big Airtable uh, fan girl. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, Nelson. Awesome. It was great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, guys. All right. Nearbound. We'll see you around. Until next time on the Nearbound Podcast.